I want to be uh, the first to welcome you to what is the 125th episode of Little Known Facts. And I am sure, can you hear me? Can you all say hello so we know if our mics are working? I think, I think it's working, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're recording this. This will be a podcast episode. This will be on YouTube. And so just know whatever you say or do will be um, recorded <laughs> forever. Um, I'm so unbelievably honored and thrilled to welcome Mary Steenburgen and Ted Danson to the podcast. If you're not sure, this is Mary Steenburgen and this is Ted Danson. Um, when I talked to Neil about wanting to do something on this stage, which has been home to so many of the most beautiful artists working uh, over the years, including Mary and Ted, who have both graced the stage here with their beautiful talents. I couldn't imagine two better people to begin this series with because it is a big thing to return to the theater. Sometimes when Hollywood and other opportunities snap people up, they become rarely seen on a stage. And I also just want to say, the reason uh, Ted and Mary are here, aside from their being very sweet about my podcast, is because Neil Pepe and Mary McCann, who are here today and run The Atlantic, are two of the warmest, most generous humans on the planet who we really would do anything for. Um, so I just wanted to say that in case at the end I'm crying and forget all the thank yous. So thank you to everyone here, Ian and the crew who made this all happen. Thank you between SantaCon and all the other things going on for braving the New York City streets to be with us. And um, little known fact, I have been such huge fans of both of yours for so long. And the idea that I'm now, it's a little like looking into the sun for me right now. Um, <laughs> I'm usually... Ted is going to be so happy with this interview. <laughs> so I will forever today remember December 8th because someone will say, do you remember the first time you met Ted and Mary? And I'll be like, yes, I remember where I was. I remember what they looked like when they walked in. Someone was carrying two poinsettias to their side. And it was glorious. But I wonder if you two remember the first time you saw each other and met. We yes. do. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank we, we you all for coming. This was amazing. <laughs> Do you want to begin? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, okay, first time um, Mary was starring in Cross Creek, um, and I went in for an audition to play her husband, and I was sitting in, in this downstairs area of this building, and then there were interior stairs going up, and it was raining and she was late and she ran up the stairs and I looked at her and then we went up and we sat and we auditioned and I did not get the part, thank God, because I was a hot mess back then. So she wouldn't have even seen me. But that was the first time. I remember that he was very charming and what I loved about him was that he was very handsome but funny. Like, just handsome doesn't do it for did, me at did all. You, did you fight for me to get the part? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not hard enough. Uh, Peter Coyote got that part, but, um, but then years later, and then we met at um, Henry Winkler's birthday party one right. year, and uh, I was a huge Cheers fan by then, so I stopped you and like fangirled you for quite yes, a while. Yes. And then, uh, and then we met a third time during the inauguration of Bill Clinton at some party or something. I think we we're getting dip right. at the same For, table yes. or something. And, and you took a little, I can't quite remember, but you took a little, it was not a barb, but it was a little bit of a, mm. and you I went, say that. Why I know. would I do that? I have no idea. I think to get my mean, attention. What did she say? I don't know. It was the, just the equivalent of a pigtail in the inkwell kind of thing. Um, I just remember that. I remember looking up going, oh, wait, what? <laughs> well, I don't remember that. But I re and, then, and then we met again on a movie. 
So we did a movie together that um, is okay. But, um, <laughs> Pontiac <laughs> but, but, Moon, right? What? Was Pontiac, Moon. Pontiac, Pontiac Moon. Pontiac Moon. Yeah. And, but it was a great uh, first, date. first date. Yeah. Did it start? Okay, so first of all, I happen, I think my friend Alexandra Styron is here today, and I met Al because I was working on a, a huge Broadway event for Bill Clinton and in 92, I guess, yeah. and part of my reward for getting to do such a wonderful event was to go to the inaugural, the Arkansas inaugural oh. ball. I was there. Yeah. yeah. You were, I, no one barbed me at all. <laughs> The entire night. It was really thrilling to be at the ball of the state uh -huh. where he had been governor, and it was thrilling. And there was, I remember, kind of a smattering of, like, I wonder if Mary Steenburgen, the Arkansasian? Um, <laughs> Arkansasian or Arkansan. Ah, we accept either. Was going to be there. Let's, yeah. let's actually talk about that, because you've been um, really a, a friend a real friend, not just a Hollywood celebrity campaigning for someone. How did you meet the Clintons originally? Um, my dad was a freight train conductor, and um, uh, he went to an event where the young governor of Arkansas was speaking about mentorship and uh, encouraging retired people to mentor young people. And he said, you know, we have a young woman from this community, and she she went to New York and studied and was a waitress for years, and she's recently done her first film, and it shows you, you know, the talent in this community. And he sees someone, like, wiping tears, and he finishes his speech, and at the end of it, he goes out to the audience, and he says, sir, I see my remarks have touched you in some way. I'm Bill Clinton. And the man said, well, I'm Morris Steenburgen, and if you're going to talk about my daughter, I think you better meet her. And that was the two of them, the two of them met first. And, um, and so when Todd and I got married, Bill actually gave me away because my dad wasn't there anymore. And so we're, we're close. We, we love them very much. But that went from like a conversation on like a campaign trail stop to it really happened. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like then you meet him. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, well first, well, first yeah. first of all, in those days, I was more famous than them. Right. So that was, and, right. and the weirdest thing is, in some ways, not so much with Hillary, but especially with Bill, our relationship gelled at that moment. And so I'm like his bossy, annoying sister that has no like when the secret service guys would want someone to tell him it's time to stop playing cards and everyone wants to go to bed they always sent him mary because because <laughs> i i just don't you know I, that's how we know he's family he's family i get so, it so right so um it was it's just a strange weird phenomena that and, and when people talk about their Hollywood, the Hollywood connection, and I always laugh because it had nothing to, it really had to do with Arkansas. And, and um, so it's just been a kind of bizarre and unexpected journey that was a privilege and at times painful and at times inspiring. And it's been a part of both of our lives. I, I took him to meet Bill at the White House um, which was weird. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, to sit down with, to a, you know, a dining room table, just the four of us, uh, it, oh, you know, I, I, I was trying to, I knew how much they loved Mary. They were vetting I knew, you. Yes. And I was trying to not be, you know, too far forward, you know, in my whatever. So it was, it was a bizarre evening. But then at one point, either that morning or the, I mean, the next morning, it was just Bill and me and a Secret Service agent and <laughs> passing in a hallway, but he stopped and talked. And it was clearly, who are you? What are your intentions? <laughs> you know, version of, you know, good morning. That's Hetty. Yeah. yeah. That's Hetty. Yeah. Um, well, Wait, let me jump in yes, one more time, ahead. because what's amazing about them is all they care about is you. They are so interested in what you're doing, who you are. They're so it's really 
even though I was incredibly nervous, it's amazingly easy conversation because they're so interested in people that they, they wanted to know all about you and where you came from and all of the above. Well, that's a quality. I would boomerang back to you guys because I had the opportunity to be hanging in the back with you in the dressing room and I felt like you were both incredibly inquisitive and curious about me and it was very touching that you took the time to do that. Um, so I thought I'd turn it around and let you guys just interview me now. Well, actually. That's fine. <laughs> Let's, we can, I can tell you a story about your friend, um, Al Styron, that I think she knows, but her okay. mom knows, Rose, okay. who's a friend of ours. But when I uh, was going to do Ragtime, they were trying to figure out who was gonna play m my husband. And uh, Milos Forman had it in his head that he wanted a real life writer to play and not an actor. It ended up being an actor that was cast, but... but Peter Coyote. No, not no, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he, um, he interviewed several, or auditioned several great writers, including J.P. Don Levy, but... Um, Al's dad came to audition, um, Bill Styron came to audition to play father. And um, I fell in love with him. I actually wanted him to do it because I fell in love with him because he was so um, brave. He was so brave. It was like a total thing that was so weird for him. Whereas other people that came to audition would just read it and they were cautious and they weren't and bill just he was so brave and and i was like oh this is who it should be but it 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 wasn't but i but i loved him so. that is incredible it's my bill bill styron yeah, story. yeah yeah everyone should have one yeah everyone should have a bill styron <laughs> story you both grew up uh it's a very big thing to get to new york if you did not grow up in New York. Many of us who are from the East Coast really take it for granted, like, well, I drove over the George Washington Bridge and I mm -hmm. found my way. But mm -hmm. you came from uh, Arizona mm -hmm. and you came from Arkansas. And I would imagine you weren't making annual trips to Broadway and, and dinner at Sardi's. So, you know what, I could be wrong. I'm imagining that that was not your childhood. So maybe starting with you, go ahead, Ted. Um, I grew up in Arizona, but at age 13, um, I went away. I, my father was an archaeologist and an anthropologist and the director of a museum, and we lived outside of town, and all my friends were either Hopi or Navajo children or sons and daughters of ranchers. So it was very, you know, 19, early 60s, amazing, run out the door and come back. Ride bear dinner. back on your horses out into the desert. I cut quite a figure on a horse. Um, <laughs> that's my father speaking. Anyway, then I went away to a school in Connecticut, Kent School for Boys in Connecticut at 13. 18, I went to Stanford, didn't know what to do, didn't do anything, fell in love with acting. Transferred to Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon, we all thought we'd get into... Uh, repertory companies, because that's it was a classical training. And no one did in my class, and so we all just went on group to, uh, to New York, and knew I was gonna hate it, fell in love with it, uh, and was there about six or seven years before I moved to Los Angeles. So they sent you to boarding school? No, that was my idea. You wanted to go. I wanted to go. From my sister, bareback to this whole other... I didn't want to be left out. My uh, rancher kids who lived, friends who were too far out of town to go to school were being homeschooled up to a point and then being sent away to a school. My sister was going to Wellesley and leaving. I didn't want to be left alone. Right. So I, I thought it was my idea. My mother loved it because it was a church school. My father probably loved it because he knew I was a lazy student and... Um, all of the above, but I really thought it was my idea. So when you got to Stanford, when you say you found acting and then you transferred to the wonderful Carnegie Mellon, uh, how did you find it, or how did it find you? Um, silly but true, I, uh, I followed a, a young lady named Beth, um, Beth who is I here finally... Tonight. Beth? Beth. <laughs> 
I wish that were true. I would so love to meet her. Don't Thank be you for shy. my career. <laughs> Um, well, you'd like to thank her. Yeah, I would. I would. We. Uh, I wanted to have a cup of coffee with her. She stayed for five minutes and then said she had to go to an audition. And I thought, well, can I come? And she said yes. And then discovered that you had to do something to remain in the room. So I made something up. And I heard somebody laugh. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Not bad. <laughs> And I got the smallest part you could be uh, to get in Man Is Man, a Bertolt Brecht play. And I was like the fourth rifle carrier from the left. <laughs> and I was just smitten. It was like I had met my gypsy clan. I was like, just, I was just, a light bulb went off. I literally moved my station wagon to the back of the theater and slept in my station wagon and never left until I transferred to Carnegie. Do you have a Beth? Well, I sure didn't have a station wagon. <laughs> but I, uh, um, no, I don't know that I have. The, if I have a Beth, it's that I remember t having a conversation with two girlfriends of mine in Arkansas, and one of them said, "You know, I know what I want to be. I want to." She played bass in a band. And she and that's what she wanted to do, um, she, and the other one wanted to sing, and I remember thinking, what in the world will I say when it's my turn to say, you know? And then I literally remember thinking, I'm an actor, and which is such a weird thought for a girl in Arkansas who's never traveled anywhere or knows any actors, but my tiny little limited experience of having gone to see um, South Pacific at the Front Street Theater in Memphis or, you know, little, or, or being in the crucible in school and stuff, it just, I remember that those moments were breathless for me, that I could literally barely breathe and that, that there was something so utterly compelling about theater and, I had been a kid who, there had been some sadnesses in my childhood um, that my escape was to read books. And, and so for me, I think in that moment, one of the things I realized was that I had been an actor for years. It's just that nobody had ever seen it because it was all up here. That's how I feel. <laughs> exactly. All the time. We feel that way a lot, you know, <laughs> as women in the business. Yeah. We're, we're acting all the time. It's just that no one notices. But um, <laughs> no, but I, I, knew, I knew that those worlds, those imaginary worlds that I created and I loved, especially loved um, English, you know, I loved Dickens and the Bronte sisters and all that stuff. And it was, it was just my preferred uh, way of getting through the world. And so having, becoming an actor, I, th I think it felt like I always was that. And what I've had to work a little harder at is becoming an actualized human being that isn't acting, huh. you know. So how did you make your way to New York? Um, well, I went to one year of college to a wonderful school in Arkansas called Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. And um, I was in, I was cast in uh, the play, a play there, The Night Thoreau Spent in Jail, and played Lydia Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson's wife. And the professor there said, you know, you should go to New York because they're going to know what to do with you and you belong in New York. And I said, well, I wouldn't even know where to go. And he said, well, here's a list of schools. And he gave me all the schools you would imagine. Um, some of them, like Juilliard, I knew I couldn't even begin to afford and it was four years and all this stuff. But he checked this one, there's one check mark, I still have the paper, and it says the Neighborhood Playhouse and I only applied to one school, and it was the neighborhood playhouse. And I, I was the last class to study with Sandy Meisner uh, before he had his... A voice uh, box. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember his voice. 
And anyway, that was, uh, I'm still very close with the Neighborhood Playhouse and with Pamela Moeller, who runs the school, and I love it very much. That's my alma mater. That's incredible. Yeah. Were you guys here at the same time? Did your yes. New York yeah. here? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we like to think that we are both in the drama bookstore. Is that still here at the drama bookstore? Yeah. yeah so you know, in the stacks <laughs> at the same time. So that's what we think, is that we were like across from each other and maybe looked up and saw each other and then went back to... Um, <laughs> somewhere between 1972 and 74, for sure. That's, at least that's when I was at the Playhouse. And yeah, I came to New did. York in 72 and... We both did. Yeah. So you both had pretty remarkable beginnings in that whether they were large parts or small parts, you got work as an understudy pretty quickly in a Tom Stoppard play. Is that right? right? Yeah, after Magritte and... Yeah, and, and then was able to go on. Uh, yeah, I, I take baby steps, uh, or I have taken baby steps, because yeah. I think, you know, God knows that I can't take too much at one time, so I had to right. do this. Not so much for... Well, we built a little lip here, so it just... Yeah. Be comfortable. So you, but what a great way to learn in oh, it was. as no, an understudy it was. in and a fancy production of something. And acting was so new to me because uh, Carnegie was all new. I'd never acted before except that one time in Stanford. And uh, did everyone stop talking or did the air go off? The air or? went off. The air went off. Oh, okay. Um, you know, you stopped talking. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. <laughs> Don't yeah. stop. Um, it, but I didn't care what I was doing. I took classes again. I studied uh, the Sandy Meisner technique with Robert Patterson here in the city. And it, I really almost didn't care if I was acting in class or being paid to act somewhere. I was just smitten, you know. And that lasted for a long time, that kind and of... And did you have funny jobs to sort of... No. Are still smitten? I'm smitten, but, but once cheers happen, once you, uh, a career start and you start making money, then uh, fear and wanting more and all of that career stuff snuck in. Before that, it was just pure joy of, I don't care. Don't pay me, I don't care, whatever. Right, I just well, want to do it. Humbly, yeah. may I say, as someone who lives with you, you do experience quite a lot of joy when you act. I yes, have, yes, I no, noticed. no, sorry, did, was that, did I not say that? You made it sound like in the old days you experienced yeah. joy. Yeah, now I just want money, I want lots of money, and I don't care about joy. <laughs> Is this free? I just would like to present you with a bottle of smart water as a thank you for being you here today. You can see I don't actually drink smart water. No. Uh, <laughs> would, you, would either of you like to have some water now? No, thank you. Okay. Because there's always time for a water break, I Is believe. Is this one of those places where you edit or no? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Remember right. I promised there'd be a great edit? So far, nothing we've said is in the episode. There's not one thing starting, go. We're gonna start now. Um, well, it would be, I would be remiss to not talk about Cheers because it has- You already expressed a little disdain no, for the norm. Okay. No, I wanna, I wanna explain what I meant. What I meant when I was talking about Cheers in the dressing room earlier is that I probably watched every episode of Cheers. I mean, that's just probably true. And I think most people, whether you were of the age to watch it when it came on the first time or watch it now, would be hard pressed to find a show that's less perfect. Because what it did in terms of casting the most remarkable people who whether they were or grew into the parts as it went on, um, whether you had writers who understood how to write for those people or learned how to write for them, it really created, I mean, I think the theater is a place where all of us feel like, oh, this is my chosen family. I found my people. And even though Cheers was a made up place, though we were confused because you could visit it in Boston, <laughs> Um, but you would not be there when I went. <laughs> because I wasn't an actress yet, and I didn't understand that it's just this sign and not the actual, there's a sound stage somewhere. <laughs> um, you created a world where people who didn't always feel included outside 
that bar, walked in there, whether they were Norm or Woody or whoever they were, and there was their family, and they felt loved. And it was an incredible thing to think that some place like that could exist. And you guys found a way to make us, and this is so silly because it was a TV show um, and not a real place, but it felt real to us. And I'm sure you've spent the last, you know, 25 years or more having people come up to you who feel like, I know you. Um, I've gone through things with you. Yeah, no, it's been a remark. I mean, people come up or see me and they start smiling by and large because they remember something funny that I was part of. And, yeah. and, and ha I, everything I do, I'm sitting here because I'm sitting next to you because of because yeah. you know of Cheers. Uh, well, you're so I'm also here because I invited Mary, and she was like, "No, I Ted. understand. That's <laughs> that's why I asked about the editing thing. No, I know. I, I've already seen the <laughs> yes. evening with Mary Steenburgen. Yes. yes. <laughs> but that's okay. The point is, once you're here, what you do with an opportunity. Oh. Right. Yes. For all of us, that's the lesson. It doesn't matter why you're here, but make the most of it. Ooh, two against one. No. <laughs> no, it's really like, are you kidding? This is for all of us. We're all so excited to have a moment with you together because you bring so much love in the room with you when you walk in. And that's what we felt watching that show. And I wonder, did you audition for Cheers? Yes, so I did. So um, can you talk about that? I, w I had, uh, somebody had fallen out the day before of an episode of Taxi. And this was all on Paramount Lot. And back then, they were like seven or eight really well-known sitcoms mm -hmm. at Paramount uh, being shot at the same time. And uh, it was like this little family. So I came in at the last minute to play a, a hairdresser on an episode of Taxi. And Jimmy uh, Burroughs, Les, and Glenn Charles were just starting to put together uh, Cheers. And they were starting to cast it. And Jimmy had remembered auditioning me for something uh, maybe the year before and I didn't get it so he saw that I was on the lot they brought me over and we talked two or three times that week and um, I read and at, at one point I said they said don't don't take anything without another job without checking with us uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> So you're saying that Hold I... Hold my calls. Yeah. yeah. You're saying that I, that I, you want me for this. And they went, no, no, we're not saying that. But, <laughs> and I literally walked out the back of their office and saw coming up the stairs like a line of actors who I'd seen work, you know. Do. But it was one of the... I think it was the first time that I experienced not having doubt or allowing myself to have doubt. I just kept going, I think this is mine and I'm going to behave as if it were. Um, but then the, I think partly the reason why I did get Cheers is they, they, had all, they had ended up having three couples. Um, Fred Dreyer, who went on to be in a, 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 some sort of drama, and uh, Julia Duffy, and uh, three other, anyway, two other couples, and Shelley Long and myself. And we had gotten mixed and matched, and then they finally settled on uh, Shelley and me, and we then walked down <laughs> one couple at a time and auditioned in a room almost as full of people as this is, and a little makeshift bar, and we did a scene, and then we'd leave, and the next couple came down. Um, and I think I got it because Shelley and I worked well together, and Shelley really was remarkable. She had that character from like day one, and you really hadn't seen that character since maybe Lucille Ball or something. Right. She was spectacular. So I credit and give her a lot of credit for me being in her. Had you done comedy before? Yes. A little here and there, you know, but not, no. I mean, I was doing anything or I, I could find, get my hands on. But right. I had done, um, but I think by then I had done Body Heat and uh, Creep Show and um, The Onion Field. Yeah. Not? Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Not known. Yeah, no, no. I, d I was doing taxi, you know, at that moment, but yeah. And did you feel, uh, I know, I know, you know, history shows that it did not start out as a show with great ratings and that over time, miraculously, a network kept staying behind it so that it could find its audience and grow. Right. 
Was that as loving a family on set as it felt like to those of yes. us at home? Yeah, it was. Um, everyone was, everyone, they didn't know the long kind of overview of Cheers and the success, but they knew how lucky we were to be around that kind of writing. Um, and that, that's what I would, I don't think you had to be funny to be on Cheers. You had to just be a good actor and do that character and do that, those words and, whew, you know, they, they, it was so good, the writing, that um, you just kind of hung on to that. Um, but I, I would like to say the writing was brilliant, really brilliant. But you guys and the way you worked off of each other, you and Shelley, watch, I mean, I was such a fan of that show and, and particularly of watching the two of you and everything that Sandy had taught me in school, I watched the two of you doing, of just working off each other. And uh, the words were brilliant, but you guys really, well, everyone on that show was. But you two together, it was like magic. So when she left, did let's you? Just, let's just yeah. soak that in. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't move on too quickly. I'm so sorry. He'll let you know when it's I'm time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we have a signal, of, like, go like this, when I can, when I can move on. Um, when Shelley left, did you think, oh, maybe the show's done? Yes, yeah, maybe I was, you know, maybe uh, with a new dance partner, I won't be good. Yeah, well, or maybe absolutely. you won't enjoy it as much, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, all of the above. It was very scary. But we'd already experienced um, the writing, being able to absorb loss because Nick Colasanto had died after the third year, and uh, in came Woody Harrelson. <laughs> you know, right? What a I daring idea! I mean, Woody's idea. astounding, but the the character Woody was also astounding. Yeah. You know, and they did that. And uh, Kelsey Grammer came in and played Fraser Crane, that wasn't part of the first year. So we knew how good the writing was, and they found crazy. You know, That's Kirstie amazing. Alley. Yeah. <laughs> Who crazy was great. in a great way. She I mean, was she, was she was like a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown <laughs> in all scenes. Sure. She was amazing. She was truly amazing. Well, method, method acting. Um, yeah, no, go ahead. No, I was just about to say that they discovered that um, Shelley and I were so different from each other that it was kind of oil and water, and it, and it worked for a romantic relationship on but Kirsty and I are kind of cut from the same cloth, so it didn't quite work. And they discovered that they had to have a triangle. There was always a triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's how brilliant the writing is, yeah. you know, that they got that and yeah. addressed it immediately. Amazing. Well, your, your beginning um, has a story that involves a, a, an actor, and I, I'm sorry that things didn't go better for him, Jack Nicholson, because he was so... <laughs> Promising. It was so promising. Um, but, but, you know, there's a story that, that goes around about how you got that part, and I'm just curious if it's apocryphal or really how it went down. So can you share um, how you got cast in your first movie opposite Jack Nicholson at a very young age? Um, yes. Well, some pretty young. T I was 24. But that feels really <laughs> it feels young now. Yeah. Uh, goo goo gaga. Yeah. So uh, I was um, I g had graduated from I went two years to the neighborhood playhouse. I got out, ready to take the world by storm. No one was interested. I I uh, was a waitress during my school years and then kept waitressing. Um, I worked at numerous restaurants that are sadly no longer there on the east side. One was called Hudson Bay Inn. And then um, uh, after a couple of years of nothing happening, a group of us from the Neighborhood Playhouse formed a comedy Im improv group, group. And we needed audiences. So don't ask me what this logic is, but we knew someone at the Bureau of Alcoholism of the city of New York. So. <laughs> We um, started doing shows for halfway houses, so my first acting jobs was in 
Badford Stuyvesant and Harlem and uh, the Bowery Wait, improv shows. A little cute improv in shows houses. in halfway Like houses. anyone have a like calling out to the well, audience. Like, what do you want to see? <laughs> Every single time, two drunks on a street corner. <laughs> like this would be the variation would be two drunks on a bus, two drunks on the subway, and they wanted they wanted to see them what they had been through, you know, and so and. Um, I remember at the time, I was deeply inspired by a show uh, on Broadway, and it was Lily Tomlin's one woman show. And I'd gone to see it, and I remember just being like so wanting to be her and learning that lesson in comedy that comedy more than anything is really your own voice. Like you have to, you cannot be brilliant Lily Tomlin's version of funny. You have to find the funny that's Mary Steenburgen. And I remember consciously, you know, in those terrible little sad, you know, shows where sometimes there were five of us and there were three of them or, <laughs> you know, and I mean, it was, you know, trudging through the snow and going up three flights of stairs. And then we did a whole comedy show and no one laughed one time. And at the end of it, they said, we're so sorry. We thought, we were told that there was a message about alcoholism in here and we just kept waiting for the message. <laughs> and it was like, there was, no, we're just, we're just doing comedy improv for you. So, um, but um, eventually I, I moved up in the world to a better restaurant. I, I, I was uh, a waitress at the Magic Pan, which some of you may remember. Who doesn't love a crepe? Yeah, who doesn't love a crepe? And so um, uh, I wore a little green dirndl uh, and black uh, orthopedic shoes and stockings and uh, was dressed like my version of a little French girl. and. Um, there were two magic pans, those of you who remember. One was on the west side, inexplicably both on 57th Street. One on west <laughs> and one on east between 3rd and Lex. So mine was between 3rd and Lex. And it was populated with the most wonderful, crazy, fantastic characters, all who were actors. And this lovely couple who made sure we all made it to our auditions. We could you know, take an extra shift later. And it was just this really fun, wonderful place. And so somehow, uh, so Chris Guest, who directed Best in Show and Waiting for Guffman, some of my favorite movies, his mother, Jean Guest, saw me uh, at the uh, Manhattan Theater Club because our comedy improv group was now the resident company at the Manhattan Theater Club in their cabaret between shows. And she saw me and she recommended me to a big casting director and I went and I met with her and it was a nice meeting and at the end of the meeting, I'm about to leave and um, this is where it gets, this is very uh, weird sounding but literally the bells in my head went off for the first time in all these years. And, it, and I turned around and I said, before I leave, are you casting anything in particular? And she said, Ah, I'm casting a movie called Going South and I would love to get you in on it, but it has to be very beautiful models or well-known actresses and you don't really fall into either of those ca categories, <laughs> which was true, but I looked at her <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I, I'm just going to go wait outside until you maybe change your mind and give me a script. Now, in the history of my being in New York, this is exactly what all my friends had told me to be like, and I'd never been like that once. You could ask anyone who knew me. That was not part of my repertoire. It was my moment, and I knew it somehow. And I went, and I went outside, and I sat down, but then I started feeling like, oh my God, she's never gonna call me in on anything. So I like, just blew the one important person I know in this whole city. and unless you count the people at the Bureau of Alcoholism in the city of New York. And, and so I, I'm looking down at my feet and I'm literally composing my apology because someone else had gone in there to meet with her. And I'm, I'm thinking of what I'll say and the excuse I'll make. And I see these two feet 
And I hear this voice saying, are you waiting to see me? And I thought, oh my God, that sounds just like Jack Nicholson, <laughs> who would probably be in California or in Hollywood or something. And, he, and I said, no. And he goes, you're not? And I said, no. I still haven't looked up. And he goes, why not? And I finally look up, and yep, it's him. It's Jack Nicholson in the flesh. And I said, I don't have a script. He walks over to the desk, picks up a script, hands it to me, and he goes, okay, 10 minutes tomorrow at whatever it was, 1 o'clock or something. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then I thought, I better not wait and talk to that lady. I better just get out. Get out. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> And so I went, I lived, um, I lived with my friend Peter. Um, on Coyote. A, no. <laughs> Just kidding. That never happened. I know, I know. <laughs> but, uh, and, um, and we uh, read the thing over and over and over. And um, we lived in a fifth floor walk a walk up with a busted out window at the back that my landlord would never fix, so we just put plywood up. It was charming. And anyway, I stayed up all night, prepared for it, like tried to sleep, but that was stupid. It wasn't gonna happen. And, and then went over there, dressed vaguely in what I thought maybe was, looked slightly like an 1800s outfit without looking too cheesy and corny. It was subtle, but it worked, and so anyway, I go and I start reading and reading, and he goes, um, and his pizza came, and I stood up to leave, and he goes, no, sit down, eat the pizza, keep reading. We read every scene in the movie twice. At one point, the woman looked in there. I think she thought something untoward was happening, but there wasn't, and so I read everything, and, and then he goes, um, as I'm about to leave, he goes, you know, I, I want to direct this. And I said, uh-huh. And he goes, you know what that means? And I went, yeah. And I had no clue what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> and um, everyone told me as soon as I left, I said, what did that mean? And he goes, that means he can't cast you. You know, you've never done a movie. Your right. last name is Steinberg. It's too weird for words. And so, you know, he's not going to cast an unknown named Steinberg. And so, so um, I went back to my waitressing, and then several days later, the message came: "You're going to Hollywood for a screen test." I go out. I I borrow a thousand dollars for some from some friends in Arkansas and buy some nice clothes. I go out. They put me up at the Chateau Marmont for one night, but I stayed a couple of extras nights. And I did the, um, the screen test in uh, wardrobe, makeup, and all these big stars were doing the test as well. And at the end of five days, I'd run out of money. I needed money to get back to the magic pan to my waitressing shift. I was down to like $2. And I went into Paramount and I said, thank you so much for that really unique and fantastic experience. Could I have my one night's hotel bill in cash? Um, and they, Jack was smoking a big cigar and he goes, don't worry about it, kid, sit down because you're on the payroll. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and I will say that I haven't seen that screen test and we just got a copy of it that our family's gonna watch together over Christmas. <laughs> They found it in the depths of Paramount Studios. The, stu the Paramount's been important to both of us in our lives. And so. I just got chills when you <laughs> told that story because it really sounds like a fairy tale. It was a fairy tale. It was. And then you do the movie. Yeah. And do you go back to waitressing at all? I didn't. I did, yeah. grow I did end up on unemployment, and I did end up really close to being penniless again, but I, my uh, second movie was, um, I think about nine months to a year later, and it was time after time with Malcolm McDowell. Um, Did you sleep with him? <laughs> First of all, may I say one thing about that? Her name is Mary. She absolutely did not have to sleep with anyone to have children. If you know the story, Good, don't I have to. worry. Yeah. Don't worry. It's Christmas and it's her holiday. 
Um, yes, and you have two incredible children, and and you married that co-star, Malcolm McDowell. Who I um, still adore. He's yes. a very good friend, and uh, he's um, wonderful and has three little boys who are my kids' little half-brothers who we all adore as That's well. That's amazing. Yeah. Life is funny yep. how it works out. Well, you won an Oscar. Mary Steenburgen has won an Oscar, which is no small thing, from Melvin and Howard. Um, that was your third movie? So, no, no more magic pan for you. The thing that is remarkable when you go home, as you will, and you are going to Google all night every little reference, because there's so many things that they're teasing that I've gotten to live with in the this happened very quickly, like the two weeks since we decided to do this. Um, when you listen to your Oscar acceptance speech, what's incredible is your accent is still so much more a young girl from Arkansas than you sound now. So when you listen to it, it's remarkable because really, over time, we acclimate to where we are. And obviously, you don't sound British at this point. But you really have transitioned from sounding much more like a Southern person. I mean, maybe when she's drunk, does she sound more? Drunk and pissed. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Then it comes out. That seems appropriate. You talked about, uh, you were married before also. And you talked about how you... <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, you talked about how you had met her at that audition that you didn't get. Peter Coyote got the movie. Yes. And you said it wouldn't have worked because I was a mess at that time. It wouldn't have been like the right time for us to be Ted and Mary um, as you are now. And I don't mean the Ted and Mary from the Mary Tyler Moore show, <laughs> which is a very iconic Ted and Mary yeah. as well. Um, but then you did meet at the right time. So timing is such a huge thing, right? Like Jack Nicholson has to walk into that place at that time and you have to have the courage on that crazy day to be like, I'm going to wait, right? Like To so, listen to my angels or yeah. whatever that was, yeah. So did you, were you divorced when you guys met? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and she still isn't. And we were both definitely divorced. I feel, I feel so comfortable with you guys. Like, were you divorced? Did you get divorced? Because So did you know, like, sets are very exciting, and it's so intimate, and you're in this little bubble. And I made a rule. I, I married someone that I met working together, and I had, like, this six-week rule that if I still remembered that person six weeks after the job, I've been married 22 times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> of course, all our lines are written for us, and people are leaving $100 bills in an envelope in our hotel room. You don't take the trash you out. You don't take the trash out, and, yeah. and, and it's, all, um, it's all taken care of for you, and the lines are written, and then the thing is over, and that's why I wait six weeks. And then if I'm still like, oh, Dominic, yeah. Um, was there a six-week rule? Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I, we, we, we came in knowing a lot about each other, ourselves. And, uh, I, you know, I had worked on myself for like a year and a half, really trying to grow up and be the kind of person that I knew I should be. Hmm. And I took it very seriously in that period of my life. But I knew that I was incapable of having a relationship that I wouldn't mess up. And you also said I, you had I, this similar yeah, thought. Yeah, I had just told, right before that movie, I'd just broken up with someone. And I, and this was someone that every woman thought I was insane to not just want to marry, you know. Because it, Peter Coyote is amazing. No, no, it's not He's Peter. amazing. He's <laughs> amazing. Yes. But, uh, but I, when I couldn't make it work, I told my friend that I look like I'd be good in a relationship. I present like I would be, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. And um, I now know this about myself. I have two children, they're amazing, I adore them. I'm done. 
I'm not going to put myself through this again. I'm finished. And when we first started working together, it was not on my radar hmm. at all. It was not even a thought in my mind. In fact, Whoa. wait. <laughs> so the first night that we, that we kind of were around each other on this movie was I had just wrapped a movie broken up with my boyfriend, gone through hell, and stayed up all night at a wedding on the set of the editor and... Um, his wife. His now wife. <laughs> and I was, I was a part of the wedding, and then, so I never slept, and I had to get on a plane and fly to San Francisco to find out if Ted Danson would approve me for this part. That was, no, that was the spin you got, because I didn't, that was not, that's not what happened. We, I just heard that we were meeting. Okay. Well, I heard differently. And then I got and, approval. And I was really concerned about the fact that I was literally on fumes. I had not been to sleep. Anyway, I go, we go there, and we go out to dinner at one of Wolfgang Puck's restaurants in San Francisco that I don't think is there anymore, but... Um, you can get it from the freezer section in any <laughs> restaurant, right? For on our anniversary, Trader we'll Joe's. do that. Yeah. But I like the barbecue <laughs> chicken pizza myself. But, um, but I remember that he was shooting a movie where they had put extensions in his hair to make his hair long. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were mine. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I, met, I remember us sort of meeting at the bar, and I'm like, hello, hello, nice to see you again. And then he, he said, here, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you where we're seated. And it was with the director and the costume designer. And, and I walked behind him, and of course he's wonderfully tall, but he was tossing his fake hair. <laughs> and, and it was like tossing it, and... And I just remember thinking, this is the most ridiculous creature I've ever met. <laughs> and I am about to spend two months playing his wife on camera. So. And the next 25 years, yeah. actually. <laughs> actually. Yeah. Do you remember doing that with your hair? Uh, I was, you I was love that enthralled hair. with my hair. Yeah. To the point when I was showering and, a, and a, one of the little beads would fall off and a, and a strand of hair would fall off. I would be like, oh, oh no, like it was mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I loved my hair. Oh, Lord. Um, or whoever's hair it was. It was but special. I, here's what I was thinking, because usually, um, I know you don't believe this, but I, I, around beautiful women, if there's no introduction or something like that, it's all very peripheral. You don't. I don't look at beautiful women until you know, there's. That a, always makes it sound like I've browbeat you. You have. <laughs> um, no, this was back then, even then. So or I'm shy, I'm embarrassed, or whatever. But the, here, you're about to work with each other, and you're getting together. The whole deal is that you now have yeah. license to, you know, look. And I was just knocked out by how radiant and beautiful and your laugh and your smile. And I was, I, I was not like, ooh, I'm madly in love. I was like, I wish I were capable of having a relationship because what an amazing person. Yeah, so I was smitten even though I wasn't, yeah, she thought I was weird, but <laughs> yeah. And over the course of that film, did it go? Well, did first it, off, that DK? night I told yeah. her literally every everything about everything you. about me on the side. You know, it was like I made all these discoveries about myself. So it was like I couldn't stop blabbing about who I was, where I was, and what a mess I was, and which I'm sure was a great turn on, huh? Uh, Not since her nights at the <laughs> alcohol bureau had she met anyone. As much of a mess <laughs> as Ted Danson at the chemistry dinner read. Yeah. But somehow you won her over. It was it it wasn't right away. Um, I I now tell the truth. Tell no, the truth. my my first reaction was, man, he's got He's got a lot on his plate to work through, but it was like he 
he also struck me as somebody who was very a very rare person in that every crazy thing he told me about his family and his life and himself he was owning in this really beautiful way so i was struck by that that i loved and and then we started working together and then we would all go out to dinner and ted wouldn't be there and i just noticed oh ted's not here oh bummer and it was like we were friends and 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 i also remembered that i had this image even though i'm an actor and i should have known better i had this image of him being this sort of slick tv guy um which i like to say later was dispelled by the fact that slick tv guys don't say gosh a rooney after making love <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you will be tonight. <laughs> but but I did, I think I was surprised. I think I was surprised by like how um <laughs> how humble and like how real and how what a mess up kind of. He wasn't at, there was no slick TV guy there. And it was actually such a fascinating background, his family, and you know, there's like an innocence to his family, and and to the, it's, it was just such a different thing than I thought he was, you know, and we became really great friends. We did, but yeah, let's get to the yeah. So one weekend, <laughs> one weekend, um, knowing that this is not going to be relationship time. What could we do together that'd be fun? I know, because we were playing these kind of 1960s, old fashioned y kind of couple. Uh, let's go on a, we'll go on a picnic, a canoe ride and a picnic. And there were other canoes involved. And, and we got on this beautiful canoe. This is the a big bunch river of, of Mendocino. From the movie, but he and I yeah. were in the same canoe. And it, it was a beautiful <laughs> canoe that had an outrigger. And a, you know, on one side, it had this beautiful pontoon outrigger thing. And we went up the big river in Mendocino with a picnic, and it was, we kept going, and other canoes would fall back and fall back, and it was four hours up and four hours back, and basically we fell in love by literally canoeing together with silences and canoeing you know, beautifully and effortlessly. You find out if you're in sync or not. In a canoe, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it turned out we were. Yeah, and and we, to the point where Mary, uh, this is way more than you want to know. Um, um, we, for our uh, for our uh, wedding uh, service, she wrote a poem about that time, and it, literally that canoe ride was like a, a charter for our marriage, for our relationship. She's always the one that goes, "Oh, let's go around one more curve," and. Off we go. Yeah, and you blended families, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's real. Mm -hmm. It got real. Mm -hmm. But you have sustained a relationship that is one that involves a lot of time apart. Work takes you guys apart, I imagine, some of the time. Or did you make choices to just work in L.A. or just kind of get to raise your kids and in Ojai, right? Mm -hmm. So... Did you make a decision, like, while we have these children, we're only going to choose jobs geographically in a certain way? Or how did that unfold? We had a two-week rule. Uh -huh. you, know, with, you had to find each other after two weeks. And that's gone to about two days now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know what? I, we've talked about this. I th you, you do make some choices, and life makes choices for you, and you never quite know who's in control there. But we've supported each other's actorness. We've never gone... Oh, put me before your actorness. Mm -hmm. There, there was never that kind of moment in our life. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, we wouldn't go take something and you know wherever if we were two months, three months away from each other. That it wouldn't make sense no. for that. I want to switch gears and uh, to Mary, and it's so inspiring to me. She came on the Little Known Facts podcast, and it was really. 
I can tell. It's life-changing. But there's <laughs> another thing that happened, too, which is you had to get what I understand was a pretty simple surgery, arm Very. surgery. Yeah. Um, and something otherworldly sort of happened. And I can tell this story, but probably not as good. As it happened to you. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I had to have surgery on this arm, and it was fairly innocuous, and I wasn't even concerned about it. Had the surgery maybe an hour and a half or something most, and woke up and felt completely weird. But I had had anesthetic, so it was like everybody said, drink water, drink water. And then as the night went on, and the next day and the next day, I just felt like I had a different brain. And the best way I can describe it is I went from a brain that had a normal relationship to music in that I enjoyed it. I was not a musician. I didn't dream of being a musician to a person who was obsessed with music, who, who in a room where music is playing could barely focus on what anyone was saying, had trouble thinking about anything but music, could not have learned a line to save my life at that time. Luckily, I w wasn't working because I couldn't have worked. And it was very distressing and scary. I didn't sleep. It was weird for him because it was like he was suddenly married to someone who was struggling and who was just totally distracted by something no one could hear but her. Right. And so um, around this same time, people started sending me a book that Dr. Oliver Sacks wrote called Musicophilia, and he's the doctor who wrote The Man Who Mistook His Wife for Hat. And it was about people who had had some sort of disturbance to the brain, who developed a uh, obsessive relationship with music and I looked a little bit of the book and I got really freaked out by it because there were people with brain tumors and all this other stuff and people that have been struck by lightning and all I had done was have a little surgery on my arm and so anyway there was a point at which I looked in the mirror in our bathroom and Martha's Vineyard I looked at, in the mirror and went it's not going to go away. You have to figure this out. You you have too many people counting on you. You're a mother, your wife. You you can't go off the deep end. So what do you do? Uh, so I started studying songwriting, and then um, I started writing music. I didn't really know what I was doing, but just trying to record singing, not, not because I wanted to be a singer, and I'm not a great singer. I'm an okay singer. But, but because I needed to, it was my only instrument to convey what I heard in my head. And then I eventually went to a guy on Martha's Vineyard who was a really good musician, and I said, if I sing every note that I'm hearing, can you help me make them into songs? And he said, sure. And so we crafted like t 12 songs out of the hundreds I was writing, and we sent them under my mother's name to this wonderful big music lawyer, Don Passman, who was like, I think he might be Adele's lawyer, but Quincy Jones and all these people had worked with him. And he called my manager and he goes, hey, you know that kid, Nellie Wall? I want to sign that kid. I want to work with that kid. And my manager goes, yeah, kid's not going to describe her, but I will send her in. I was, I was 54 at the time. That was 11 years ago. And so I went in to meet him, and he went, Mary Steenburgen, what are you doing here? I said, I'm near 10 o'clock, and you already said you wanted to work with me. <laughs> so, you know, can't be ageist. <laughs> and um, so I uh, wrote, um, they started sending me to Nashville to write, and I wrote with just amazing writers and have been writing for the last 11 years. Um, um, worked with Universal, and I just just signed with Warner Chapel, and I'm doing the songs for an animated film. And so I've really, and, and, and working with the people in Nashville, they are my teachers and my inspiration because in Nashville, it's the best songwriters on the planet. And so it's, it's a part of my life that's deeply important to me. I can now focus on multiple things. If I had to say to you what I think happened to me, I think that my grandmother, who was very musical, I think the genes were in there, and somehow in that surgery, that little channel of my brain got opened. And the reason it felt so weird was that 
all my friends I write music with, all by the way, who are younger than the youngest of you here, um, they, they are used to that brain. They grew up with that brain. And I got it like one day in, when I was 54 years old. And the one thing I will say about it to young people is that um, you know life has a way, and, and also even maybe more importantly to anyone our age out there, is that life has a way of saying that you're supposed to agree to this kind of universal diminishment as you get older. And one of the tragedies of that unspoken agreement is that you say no to things or I can't do it. And I don't know exactly what happened to me, but I know one thing. I've worked my ass off on it. And number two, I said yes to it. So I would say don't ever let someone convince you that if you, ha if you have a desire to do something, you know, listen to it carefully. And, you know, yeah, the world's practical and money is money and blah, blah, blah. But it, w it, it would have changed my life forever if I'd said, no somehow to this and we have dear dear friends that we never would have known were it not for music and bands stay at our house when they come to play in LA you know it's like crazy stuff I never would have known that is so I yeah. mean that this portal open to you of creativity in this whole new way I'm so happy to know that it's not a, a painful thing anymore. Oh, God, no. That it's purely oh, joyous, joyous. And that it's been this, yeah. you know, yeah. opening up of something. I, I, you know, full disclosure, and I'm sad that I can't share it with anyone because it's private, but I was able to hear some of your stuff, and, and many of the things you've written are, in fact, for projects. Mm -hmm. But Mary wrote a song. I'm going to start crying. I listened to it on a loop yesterday because it was extraordinary. It's maybe the best love song I've ever heard. It's called I Choose You. Oh. And it's something that you wrote for Ted. And I don't know what the circumstances are because I'm not you or Ted. And I felt like, oh, she wrote, she read my diary and she wrote a song about <laughs> someone I love. It's so beautiful and so amazing. And I hope someday it's something that you'll share with others because the way Cheers felt like a bar where everybody knows your name. Um, <laughs> That song really felt like yeah. it described uh, truly what it is to be seen, not just to love someone, but to see someone fully. And I think what is really lovely today as we, as we come to a, a close um, is to be in your presence, is to see two people who are continuing to do really beautiful work. The Good Place is just an extraordinary show. Um, <laughs> I'm still in the stage where my kids are home and, and trying to vet like what they can and can't watch and finding something that offers something entertaining but also very deep. And to, to be a part of a show, I, I will speak for you, I imagine being a part of a show that just is all about empathy and kindness, I can't imagine that's not a very satisfying thing to be a part of. Yeah, hugely so. Yeah, it makes me feel very good. It's extraordinary, and it's so funny. Um, and I think all of us today feel like this is the good place. <laughs> um, I know I certainly feel like that. I could go on and on with you guys forever, um, and I hope we can continue the conversation yeah, in the future. Too. You are the most remarkable and uh, the grace with which you move through the world and the way, whether it's by providence or great management, you've been able to kind of find yourselves involved in big and small ways in projects that are so meaningful and adding something to the culture of entertainment rather than diminishing it. Um, what a lucky thing uh, for all of us. And um, I just want to end, I know that you both grew Wait, up. Wait, before you yes. end, you, it's been amazing for us to be sitting here yeah, talking to you, you because so how you ask questions and what you're interested in and how you've been with us in this hour says a lot about you. So thank yeah. you so We're much. So grateful. Thank you. And I, I would... Uh, I would also like to add that we're in this sp a space at the Atlantic Theater, and one of the deepest honors of my life is to be a company member at the Atlantic Theater, and that anyone listening that's coming to New York should check out what's going on at the Atlantic Theater, because it's, 
it's cutting edge theater and w rapidly become one of the most important theaters, if not the most, in my opinion, in New York. And um, Neil Pape and Mary McCann are to credit for this and for the, the legions of young people who are inspired by them and their work. And we're, we're just honored to be here. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for being here. You'll be able to hear this on the podcast, Little Known Facts with Alana Levine. And uh, thank you to all for being here today. And thank you to Mary and Ted. This thank has been you, amazing. Alana. Hey, I heard you need an inspiration. He's a lot of handstands with some revelations. Little known back to the day. Everything's gonna be a-okay.